The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles, they're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. And brands like Porsche, Skoda, Rolls-Royce, they all honed their craft on the research and development that was needed to win wars. Gotta get back to work. Thirtieth of October, 1942. The USS Enterprise limps into the American naval base of No Mayor in the Coral Sea, just over 1,500 kilometers southeast of Guadalcanal. Enterprise had just survived the Battle of Santa Cruz, one of the most vicious battles in the early stages of the Pacific War. She sustained this severe bomb damage to her flight deck, her forward flight elevator, and then she's also got damage below the waterline. She's in trouble, frankly. And to make things worse, her sister ship, the USS Hornet, was sunk in that battle, and the Enterprise had to take on all her surviving aircraft to ferry them to safety. This has left Enterprise as the only American aircraft carrier in the whole of the South Pacific. The US has no other carriers at this point. Her crew defiantly posted a sign on their flight deck and it just read, Enterprise versus Japan. Despite all her damage, there's no time to complete repairs. Even though Enterprise is the only carrier left in the Pacific, Enterprise must go back toward Guadalcanal and that's because the ship has to disrupt what the Japanese are doing. Guadalcanal is this fight that's absolutely on a knife edge. The Japanese were launching a major offensive against the island. If that falls, they're going to control the South Pacific. The US couldn't just allow it to happen. We couldn't afford to lose Guadalcanal to the Japanese. And that meant that Enterprise had to sail right back into the danger zone. So on the 11th of November, 1942, the Enterprise set sail for Guadalcanal. On board, she has 75 men of Construction Battalion 3, nicknamed the CBs. Which were teams of construction professionals, very highly qualified in terms of welding, in terms of carpentry, in terms of all the skills you need to rapidly build things. The CBs basically turn Enterprise into a floating factory during those days before the engagement. They are able to repair the ship while it's at sea by working around the clock. They're cutting, they're welding, they're hammering. They're doing everything it can to get that flight deck ready and the forward elevator back up and running. So when it comes to fixing your aircraft carrier, 75 of them turning up is every chief engineer's dreams come true. They're still working when Enterprise goes into action two days later. While being repaired, it's launching its own planes against the Japanese battleship Hyatt. Over the next three days, she was critical to sink the hay, which was a critical part of the Japanese advancing forces. This was a major turning point of the war in the Pacific, but not just because of the battle. It was a prime example of how the Americans were able to outbuild, outrepair, outproduce the Japanese in the Pacific get their aircraft where they were needed faster and in greater numbers than the enemy. So this isn't just a story about battles. It's a story about factories and the way that Americans use factories to help win the war. It is also a story about aircraft carriers, how they came of age, how they won the war in the Pacific. And in doing so, how they changed the nature of warfare forever. Think of American might 
at the turn of the 21st century, and you immediately think of an aircraft carrier. It is a beast. It's a massive sailing city that basically, it's a waterborne advertisement for the might of the United States Navy. It has thousands of people working within it. It has a landing strip. It has the runway. It has repair facilities for planes. It has hangars to store planes. It has storage facilities for torpedoes and bombs. It is a floating airfield. You also have men that are associated with simply preparing food for and feeding the crew on a daily basis. There's a post office, a barber shop, a dentist. Literally everything is on board this one floating city. I mean, the aircraft carrier is the ultimate symbol of American power. And as the carrier rose to prominence during the Second World War, one ship led the way, the USS Enterprise. The story of Enterprise in World War II is the story of the United States Navy in that conflict. Enterprise is literally everywhere in the Pacific campaign. She's the most decorated aircraft carrier the US Navy have. She's the battle star. She's the ship they're all aiming to be, or, well, actually, this, can't, this is a Navy. They're competitive. They're one they're aiming to beat. The battle history of USS Enterprise encapsulates the US Navy's evolution from the old style of big gun Navy centered on battleships to the new Navy based on the aircraft carrier and the airplanes that can fly off of its decks. She becomes the spirit of the US Navy, the thing that encapsulates it. And it's why when Gene Roddenberry is wanting to lead America into a new world, he uses Enterprise because that is the name. But Enterprise, the motion picture, is not just about combat. It's a movie full of construction, repair, and maintenance. And in order to tell that story, you have to tell the story of the factories that provided all of the equipment that made the aircraft carrier possible. That story starts at a shipbuilding facility in Virginia called Newport News. Newport News was the epicenter of shipbuilding for the United States Navy in the years immediately before World War II. It's the heartbeat of the U.S. Navy. It's a massive facility in Virginia where the United States bases a large percentage of its fleet at different times. One of the largest factories in the world. It's a shipyard, but it's still a factory, and it's still to this day. Going into the Second World War, Newport News is actually a private dockyard owned by some very savvy investors who know that with the Second World War breaking out, you're going to have an unprecedented amount of work. So they, they make a good deal of money by floating it on the stock market. It's floated for $18 million, um, which at the time is an extraordinary sum. Newport News expands dramatically during the 1940s to support the war effort. At its peak, it employs more than 30,000 people. So it becomes you, uh, an example of the military-industrial complex. It's a private yard that the US government comes to rely on from a great deal of its naval work. Because Newport News, in many ways, is the original private public finance initiative. It marks this interesting partnership between government and private business. And this is something that defines the way that the United States rises to meet the war effort. Yet even before the war, the US Navy had turned to Newport News for a brand new class of carrier to replace the Ranger, the first truly purpose-built carrier in the American fleet. Using Newport News, the US Navy commissioned their first generation of purpose-built aircraft carriers, the Yorktown class. The Yorktown class ships were to all be 800 feet in overall length. They were to have crews, 2,900 sailors. They were capable of accepting air groups, stretching all the way up to as many as 90 aircraft. Uh, but that represented a maximum loadout for a combat loadout. It was a little bit smaller than that, but still a respectable 50, maybe 60 aircraft. Into these ships went all the ingenuity and inventiveness of American shipbuilders and engineers. Three new carriers were commissioned. The Yorktown, the Hornet, and the USS Enterprise. 
Enterprise is commissioned May 12, 1938 as a fleet aircraft carrier. And what that called on the ship to do was to provide support for a battle group. Her purpose was to basically generate as many aircraft onto the flight deck and into the air in as short a pace of time as possible to carry out a massive alpha strike. That's a first wave strike on the enemy. But all of that in support of the battleships, the big gun. The fleet carriers at this point were not to act independently. They were supposed to work with the battleships to be the eyes and ears of the American fleet. Because the Enterprise was built to meet a very specific set of limitations imposed on the war factories of the great powers after World War I. In 1922, the major powers of the interwar era signed a treaty that limited naval construction. The Washington Naval Treaty was designed in 1922 on the premise of stopping a future war by stopping an armaments race. Now it does this by limiting the size of new battleships, new cruisers that any power was permitted to build. But the, the treaty addressed primarily the big gun. What this is, is a classic case of planning for the last war rather than the next. And it's a measure of how high bound that thinking was that the treaty actually puts a limit on the caliber of big guns that could be installed on a carrier and doesn't really think about what the carriers are really there to do. They were thinking about the Battle of Jutland. They couldn't yet imagine the Battle of Midway that would eventually come to greet them. No one is imagining a battle fought at such long ranges that guns are gonna play no part in a naval conflict. No one that is, except the Japanese. One of the hidden agendas behind the Washington Treaty was to prevent newly emerging powers like Japan from building up large navies from scratch. The trouble is, it does it by going, OK, America and Britain are going to be the same. We, they're going to be equal, first-rate powers. Japan is permanently going to be stuck in a second-rate position. So for every five battleships the United States and the United Kingdom have, Japan can have the equivalent of three battleships. This immediately sets up lots of problems because the Japanese Navy feel permanently slighted. And what they say are words to the effect of, all right, if you're going to limit our number of battleships, we'll make our aircraft carriers do the battleship's jobs for us. So what they start doing is thinking outside the box. And of course, they're perfectly placed to do this because from their experience of the First World War, they already had four. Most history books will tell you that the early pioneers of carrier warfare were in the British Navy. But their pathfinders were located on the other side of the world. Because during World War I, the Japanese were allied with the British, fighting against the Germans. And as the world went to war, they had their eyes on the German colony port of Tsingtao. In 1914, Tsingtao, Onde Kingdo, is the crown jewel of the German Far East Empire. It's Kaiser Wilhelm's dream. Japan decide they're going to blockade the port of Tsingtao. So the Germans decide to launch a task force to lift the blockade, and this is led by a cruiser called the Kaiserin Elizabeth. Now, during the progress of the siege of Tsingtao, the Japanese needed to provide observation for their artillery. So they brought in a seaplane carrier, which would be launching aircraft on a regular basis to try and get over flights. On the 6th of September, a biplane launched from the ship uh, intercepts the Kaiserin Elizabeth and it drops two bombs on her. There are no bomb racks, there's no structured way to drop bombs on a target at this point. It involves someone in the aeroplane heaving one over the side and attempting to chuck it. Both bombs miss, but nonetheless this is the first strike from a carrier-launched aeroplane in history. And they also had the first aircraft shot down when a German airman just gets so fed up with them trying that he waves his pistol over the side of his aeroplane and shoots at one of the biplanes. The Japanese pilot, when he was actually coming down, just thought something had gone wrong with his aircraft. He didn't even realise he'd been shot down. 
and it was only later on examination that they found the bullet had managed to lodge in part of the engine and cause trouble. It was a not a one in a million, it is a one in a trillion fluke. It shouldn't have happened according to any laws of mathematics. It just did. And that is the first, as I know it, the first recorded takedown of an aircraft by another aircraft. British observers were watching all of this with interest. Navies, by their habit, learn from each other. The Royal Navy saw what the Japanese were doing. And so the operations in Tsingtao fed into the operations the Royal Navy was thinking about what it could do with naval aviation, what it could achieve. And in December 1914, you have a much better structured raid, and that's on Cuxhaven at Christmas. And what they do is send in a carrier with aeroplanes and make a raid on the German naval port. The British Navy would go on to conduct several other celebrated carrier strikes during World War I. But it was the Japanese Imperial Navy that would fully unleash the wrath of carriers upon the world. And it did so because of war factories. On the 19th of November, 1923, the battlecruiser Akagi began its conversion into an aircraft carrier at the Kure Naval Arsenal near Hiroshima, Japan. The Kure Arsenal is one of the four critical shipyards the Imperial Japanese Navy relies on. It's in many ways their equivalent to Newport News. After the Washington Treaty happens, when the Japanese are forced to stop all battleship construction, the Japanese make the decision to switch Kure and Yokosuka, which is another major facility in the Tokyo area, to the conversion of battleships to aircraft carriers. The switch to carriers would have a profound effect upon the thinking of the Akagi's third captain, Isaruku Yamamoto. Yamamoto, especially after having served time as naval attaché in the US, was quick to appreciate the strengths of the US Navy versus the Imperial Japanese Navy. What Yamamoto realizes is that Japan doesn't have the industrial capacity, just the factories, to go head to head with the United States by building battleships. And that forced him to look at other possibilities. The possibilities, for example, of using aircraft to sink a battleship. Instead of guns, you used aircraft. You could not only concentrate your firepower on the ship's deck, you could also do it from a distance where the enemy's battleships couldn't fire back. So during the 1930s, Yamamoto quietly went about putting the pieces in place for a military revolution. Yamamoto is key in building up one of the greatest forces in the interwar period, which really shows its mettle earlier in the war, and that's Japanese naval aviation. When Yamamoto is promoted to Rear Admiral, his first posting is to the Naval Aeronautics Department, which develops the weapons programs to the Japanese Imperial Navy. Now, it's in this position that he's responsible for commissioning not only the Mitsubishi Zero, but also the Betty Bomber and the Torpedo Bomber, the Kate three of the key mainstays of the Japanese Navy's carrier strike force. In August 1939, Yamamoto takes command of the Japanese combined fleet. And at that point, he realizes that although it's a powerful force, it still needs one thing, and it's a big thing. He needs more carriers. To achieve this, Yamamoto used a carrier force called the Kido Butai. The Kido Batai was designed around six aircraft carriers. It was designed around that because of the way aircraft operate from aircraft carriers. Yamamoto understands that Japanese aircraft carriers have an air group that's a little on the smallish side. And so the best way to use them in combat against an enemy is to concentrate your force, to bring multiple aircraft carriers moving in one body. If you can bring all your carriers together, you can turn them into a strike force. You don't launch one attack and come home. You can launch attacks in waves. You can launch different kinds of aircraft at different times. You will have one pair of carriers launching their aircraft, one pair of air carriers reading their aircraft, and one pair of carriers receiving their aircraft. He's imagining a world where he can pound an enemy force with fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo aircraft while another wave of fighters, bombers, and torpedo aircraft are approaching to hit them again. In this way, the carriers could deliver a series of continuous, never-ending strikes. You've got hundreds of aircraft all raining down hell on their targets at once, and just so many that you simply can't shoot them all down. 
Because, you know, as a defender, you can concentrate your fire on a battleship, but you simply can't focus on several hundred hornets all buzzing around trying to sting you at once. And if they take out your aircraft first, you can't even strike back at all. It's a very important mental leap, and it allows for the Japanese to attempt an operation like the Pearl Harbor attack. These new tactics work perfectly on the 7th of December, 1941, when Yamamoto unleashes his carriers on the unsuspecting US base at Pearl Harbor. And sailing towards that maelstrom was the USS Enterprise. On the 7th of December, 1941, the USS Enterprise was sailing back towards Pearl Harbor when she discovered that warfare had changed forever. On the morning of December 7th, Enterprise was returning from delivering F-4F Wildcat fighters to the island of Wake. At dawn, the ship launched VS-6. Those are SBD Dauntless dive bombers that are associated with the ship's scouting squadron, 18 of them in all. Those VS-6 SBD Dauntlesses took off to fly on ahead of the ship toward Pearl Harbor to land at the Naval Air Station on Ford Island. But as those aircraft approached Oahu, they were jumped by the enemy. And so the way that Enterprise learns that the war has started is listening in on radio transmissions from the Dauntlesses of VS-6 as they're being attacked by the enemy. Enterprise was immediately diverted southwest of Hawaii in the search to spot the Japanese carriers launching the attack. And it is a good thing that the ship was sent in the wrong direction to look for the Japanese, because if Enterprise had been sent north that afternoon, they might have found the fleet, and that's the worst possible thing that could have happened. As one under-equipped aircraft carrier versus the might the Kido Batai would not have been a good scenario for America or for Enterprise. As it was, all three US carriers operating in the Pacific, the Lexington, the Saratoga, and the Enterprise, were away from Pearl Harbor and survived the attack. The US Navy after Pearl Harbor are scrambling around for everything. If it floats, it will be sent to Pearl Harbor. And the way that they do so is by repositioning aircraft carriers from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. Hence, Enterprise is soon joined by Yorktown and Hornet, her sisters. But despite their reliance on the Alpha Strike, US planners had still not yet learned the key lesson of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was known to be a great Japanese success, but most people, including the Americans, believed that the real success was because they caught the battleships in harbor. So they hadn't fully understood that what you, know, you needed were the aircraft carriers alone and to mass the aircraft carriers. So what the United States does is it brings most of its carriers to the Pacific. Only the Enterprise and the Hornet teamed up in April 42 to launch the Doolittle Raid. Now, this was a long-range bomber attack on Tokyo, and that caused some damage to the Yokosuka shipyard, but it was really only a token exercise aimed at restoring America's damaged pride. America had been attacked at home. They wanted to return the favor. At last, the Nazis of the Far East were being made to swallow their own medicine. All hands, America. It would take the loss of the Lexington and the crippling of the Yorktown at the Battle of the Coral Sea, as late as May 1942 before it began to dawn on American planners that maybe their carriers were better off working in packs rather than alone. By contrast, Admiral Yamamoto is routinely grouping at least four of the six carriers he has operating in the Pacific into this unified strike force, the so-called Kido Butai. And this meant that he could deploy more than 300 attack planes against the enemy at any one time. And if they were able to find you in those vast swathes and wastes of the Pacific, 300 aircraft are going to be more than enough to overwhelm any traditional fleet's defences. If they find you, you're going down. But the Americans were learning. On the 4th of June, 1942, six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the combined fleet of Admiral Yamamoto 
containing four fleet carriers, is surprised by the carriers Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown off the island of Midway. Midway is one of those classic 20th century naval battles. One side is trying to lure the other into a trap, and that other side, thanks to intelligence, managed to turn the tables. Yamamoto was trying to pin the Americans against his battleship fleet, which was steaming towards Midway behind a carrier screen. The American carriers are waiting for the Japanese. And the Japanese carriers launch their attacks on Midway, and lo and behold, it soon discovers that they have been found by the American carriers. The invasion forces were hit and hit and hit again. This is the nightmare scenario. When you are rearming, when you're reloading your aircraft in a space you can't defend, for dive bombers or any kind of strike to come in at this point is when the aircraft carrier is most exposed to fuel, ammunition all over the place. You've got three Japanese carriers, the Soryu, the Kaga and the Akagi. All their refueling planes are on the deck and they're attacked by these dauntless dive bombers uh, from the Enterprise in the Yorktown. And in just four minutes, four minutes, those three carriers are reduced to funeral pyres. In the Pacific War, it's the combination of sea and air power which counts in the struggle for mastery. Relentlessly, scientifically, the extermination of the Japanese continues. The fourth Japanese carrier, the Hiryu, survives long enough for her planes to cripple the Yorktown, but is dealt a death blow by a second wave of dive bombers from the Enterprise. The Japanese battleships, well, they just turned tail and they ran off without even seeing the enemy. They didn't even fire a shot. By the time that the battle was over, four Japanese fleet carriers have been lost in combat. So for the Japanese, it's an ambitious and bold plan and it fails utterly. It was a crippling blow to the Japanese Imperial Navy, but contrary to popular belief, it wasn't a knockout one. Midway did not make it so the Japanese Navy was now inferior to the American Navy. In many ways, what Midway does is it equals the score. The Japanese still have two large fleet carriers in operation. The United States has two fleet carriers in operation. It means that both navies are about the same size when it comes to striking power. The Japanese responded to the Battle of Midway by renewing an army plan to conduct an overall offensive operation that would drive down into the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. Now, this is the scene of Santa Cruz and Guadalcanal, where the Hornet was lost and the Enterprise took direct hits, but survives to help sink the Hiei. By the time the campaign was over, Japan had four carriers still operating in the Pacific. America had only one, the Enterprise. On paper, things are still looking manageable for the Japanese. Look, they've still got two fleet carriers, and they've got another one in the works, and they've got two light carriers converted from other ships. And on top of that, the Japanese Imperial Navy have planned an entirely new class of carrier to replace the ones they've lost. So the Japanese had not given up hope after Midway. They still believed that their, their warrior spirit was superior. And then in the end, they would outlast the Americans because they would be willing to fight harder and longer. But the Japanese were about to learn the hard way that warrior spirit doesn't win modern wars. Factories do. Long before Midway, Japanese high command had recognized that they were going to take carrier losses. So five months before they launched their attack on Pearl Harbor, the Kawasaki company had laid the keel for a brand new class of carrier at their shipyard in Kobe. The Taiho was this really heavily armored carrier designed to survive multiple hits from bombs and torpedoes, you name it. This was a sensible move by the Japanese. You know, they'd had no idea that Pearl Harbor was gonna be quite so successful. And the expectation was that they'd need a strong replacement carrier by the end of 1942. In the same year, the United States had begun building a new class of carrier named the Essex at Newport News, Virginia. The Essex class was the following class to the Yorktowns. They were the successors to Enterprise and her sisters. They were built and ordered by the US Navy 
when it was realized the treaty system had long ceased to be effective and that no one was now paying attention to it. And so they're 27,000 tons. They've got 3,500 crew, and they're supposed to operate up to 100 aircraft. The fate of the Tiho and the Essex-class carriers would graphically drive home the differences between American shipbuilding and Japan's. It took the Japanese 32 months to complete the Taiho, and she was put into service just a couple of months before the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which becomes the biggest naval disaster Japan would suffer during the entire war. By the Battle of the Philippine Sea, American industrial might is beginning to tell. They're turning out warships in almost a conveyor belt fashion. The speed of their construction and the simplification of their construction meant that there were six Essex-class carriers available to take on the Japanese at the Philippine Sea when the Japanese had just got Tiho and the rest of the damaged and increasingly aged Japanese fleet. This was the day our Navy had been waiting for. It's there that this supposedly torpedo-proof armored carrier was sunk by a single hit from an American torpedo. And it's the speed with which the Essex is built that will make the crucial difference in the war. The responses to the battles of Midway and the Philippine Sea show us the extreme differences between the Japanese and American capacity for shipbuilding. Simply put, they're war factories. The, the Americans managed to scrape together three aircraft carriers for the Battle of Midway to oppose four Japanese fleet aircraft carriers. At the Philippine Sea, though, the United States has 15 or 16 aircraft carriers against the Japanese nine. Between those two battles, the Americans had built Essex and her five sisters versus Tiho and one converted carrier, the Shinano. Now that's a production difference of about four or five to one. And those carriers and new planes that they're carrying are so effective that they can simply shoot anything the Japanese could throw at them. In fact, it's such a massacre that it becomes famously known as the Great Mariana's turkey shoot. But despite being so one-sided, it wasn't the battle that turned the war. It was the war factories. The turkey shoot at the Philippine Sea is often cited as the battle that destroyed the Japanese air fleet. But despite horrendous losses, it wasn't the battle that did most of the damage. As well as her aircraft and the pilots who flew them, Japan lost three fleet carriers at the Philippine Sea. So this means that she's reduced from six fleet carriers in December 41 to just one by October 44. And even that was destroyed at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Hamstrung by mismanagement and lack of supply, Japan's war factories were simply too slow to produce the replacements they had planned in time for them to have any effect on the war. So the consequence of this is that the Japanese Imperial Navy simply can't afford to divert any carriers to escort duties or to transport aircraft from the factories to their deployment areas. This is where the size of the Pacific theater and the uh, lack of pilot training the Japanese are able to give their pilots by 1944 is proving to be devastating. The geography of the Pacific is so fast that planes were often having to fly the equivalent of London to New York just to get close to the battles. So the Japanese are sending thousands of their aircraft in very dangerous missions just to get them into battle. Many of them never appear. So while the Japanese in 1944 lose 3,600 in combat operations, they lose over 6,600 just trying to deploy them to the battle areas. The knock-on effect was disastrous. Without escorts, Japanese transport ships on the voyage home to her war factories were sitting ducks to US hunters. In 1945, Japanese shipments of oil and bauxite are slashed in half. Bauxite is one of the key elements that's used to make aluminium. And aluminium is an absolutely crucial component in Japanese aircraft. It's one of the things that makes the Mitsubishi Zero, for example, such a lightweight and versatile fighter. That means that they no longer have access to the aluminum to manufacture airplanes, and then they no longer have a sufficient supply of oil to fuel the airplanes. And if you don't have aluminum and fuel, you no longer have an air fleet. You no longer have a Kido Butai. And without the Kido Butai, Japan was dead in the water. 
By the end of 44, Japan had basically lost all of her carriers in the Pacific. So without any carriers to carry them, and with basically no experienced pilots to get them across the ocean, you've got this whole fleet of Japanese carrier planes effectively grounded. America's was not. The United States Navy, on the other hand, is just going from unparalleled naval aviation strength to unparalleled aviation strength. The Americans produce so many Essex-class carriers that they can deploy them in groups of four and then group the groups of four so that they end up creating the strike force based around the Essex. One way the Americans celebrated December the 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, was to launch the aircraft carrier Bunker Hill. A giant, yet, but only a fraction of Roosevelt's mathematical certainty of the fate in store for Japan. And it's not just Newport News that's turning out carriers. So by this stage of the war, shipyards in Brooklyn, Philadelphia and Norfolk, Virginia are, among others, all working 24-7, putting those new Essex-class carriers together. Brooklyn alone employs 75,000 people. And that includes women and African-Americans who had been previously banned from such trades. What Brooklyn becomes known as is the can-do yard because of its attitude. And it's just one example of the way that the US throws itself wholesale into war production. The shipbuilding industry is working full up and every yard in America is doing its share. They can keep building more and more of these ships. They become a conveyor belt of construction. On the other side, you've got the Japanese with technically three new carriers in the pipeline, and they're planning at least 11 more. But they've got a problem. Resources are scarce, and also their production rate is really slow, so that the Japanese war factories only manage to turn out one of these carriers before the war is over. And what happens to that? It's promptly sunk on its very first supply run. By the end of the war, the United States had 17 Essex-class aircraft carriers in fleet service. Over the course of the conflict, we commissioned just over 100 aircraft carriers of all sizes and classes. During the course of the Second World War, the Japanese commissioned 22. You cannot argue with numbers like that. Under that formula for the Japanese, World War II was unwinnable. As the war drew to a close, Japan would resort to suicidally desperate measures in its attempt to slow down American carrier fleets. Japan has no carriers and it has no pilots that can actually fly effectively from carriers. It now has to change the way it fights the war. And that's one of the reasons they bring in suicide attacks. You have to turn the pilot into the bomb. The Japanese ultimately unleash a kamikaze offensive against the United States during the course of the war that's best illustrated by what happens at Okinawa during this three-month campaign for Okinawa, the US Navy is going to lose 26 ships and it's going to suffer damage to another 164, all from Japanese suicide pilots. The US Navy suffered the greatest attrition at any point in the war of aircraft carriers. Even the Enterprise herself would be hit twice and would have to go home for repairs. The impact of the kamikaze was not just in destroying American warships. If you're fighting an enemy that is willing to sacrifice themselves in waves to try and stop you, it has a, a significant emotional impact. Here, a Japanese V pilot has ended his career with a direct hit on a carrier of the Essex class. He's caused casualties and damage on board an enemy ship. And it's for just that purpose that his own life was written off from the first day of his training. So to the Americans, it looks like the enemy is becoming increasingly more and more desperate to prevent us from approaching the home islands. And it looks like their commitment to hold us back as long as they can is absolute. The last line of defense of the kamikaze was a final frontier doomed to fail. But the reaction it provoked from the Americans would mark a significant milestone in the story of the carrier. Long after the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended the war, the USS Enterprise chalked up another first in the illustrious history of its name. In November 1961, the eighth ship to carry the name USS Enterprise was also the first ever nuclear aircraft carrier to be put into service. The ship was built at Newport News, 
and was powered by eight nuclear reactors, two for each of its propeller shafts. This was undiscovered country. It was the first time they'd actually paired nuclear reactors to operate together. It could have been a disaster. But it wasn't. And although this was potentially fraught with peril, the new enterprise is a stunning success, and it is the warship that brings us into the era of the nuclear-powered supercarrier. Along with the workhorse Essex carriers and the nuclear Nimitz carriers that followed them, the mission roster of the Enterprise reads like a history of America's involvement in the Cold War and beyond. She participates in the blockade of Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. She would steam around the world as part of the nuclear squadron. The US Navy sent a shaft there power and strength, at one point her crew forming a massive E equals MC squared on her flight deck, just because they could. It even ends up launching planes against Saddam Hussein in Iraq in 1998 and 2003. So just like her predecessor, the modern USS Enterprise covered a broad swath of modern conflict. Every conflict that the United States Navy has been a part of since the Second World War. She was decommissioned in 2012, to make way for the next generation of supercarrier, the Gerald R. Ford. Enterprise 9 will be the third Ford-class carrier to be built, but she is under construction at a time when the very future of the aircraft carrier may well be slipping into darkness. Carriers are brutally expensive. The United States' newest supercarrier, the Gerald R. Ford, costs about $14 billion to, to build. The most recent enterprise is going to cost $11 billion. The reports put it at $6.5 million a day to operate a US aircraft carrying group. Some people do ask quite reasonably if this is money well spent, especially in an era of kind of counter-terrorism operations and, and cruise missiles. The Chinese are developing a new anti-ship missile, which people claim will be able to engage warships a thousand kilometers from the coast of China. Ironically, it's the activities of the Chinese Navy that may well lift the carrier beyond those current concerns. Well, China, interestingly, has not only building anti-ship missiles, they seem to be building the carriers themselves. Now, the Liang is a Soviet-era carrier, which has been the nascent ship of the emerging Chinese carrier force. They now have a second carrying service, and they have a third, the Type 003, under construction, which they claim is going to be a nuclear-powered supercarrier equivalent to the Ford class. And furthermore, there's all this intelligence coming in that suggests it's even built a dedicated carrier base on the island of Hainan as part of its build-up in the South China Sea. The Japanese are returning to carrier construction. They're working to assemble a modern carrier force themselves, which can hopefully deter the Chinese. So the next generation in the history of the enterprise may well be first contact with a Chinese carrier fleet in the South China Sea.